herzlich willkommen. Ich bin Karl Heinz zu meiner Zuhörerin Karl-Frau, mit Susanne Titz und der Materie des Ich freue mich sehr, die beiden heute Abend hier zu Gast zu haben. Ich möchte mich vorab ganz herzlich bedanken bei der Deutschen Bahnstiftung, die seit vielen Jahren diese Reihe an Karl Talks fördert und uns ermöglicht, internationale Gäste im großen Renommee nach Frankfurt einzuladen, um aktuelle Themen der Kunstwelt und des Museums hier zu diskutieren. Ich freue mich ganz besonders, dass wir dann die Geschäftsführerin der Deutschen Bahnstiftung, Frau Dr. Rassenflug, und ihre Kollegin Frau Hanne, hier heute zu Gast sind. Danke für die Unterstützung und viel Willkommen. Sie wissen, wir haben am Freitag die Ausstellung The Tale of the Words eröffnet, hier in MK1. Diese Ausstellung ist äh, das Produkt eines vierjährigen Prozesses, den wir hier im Museum gemeinsam mit äh, Kollegen in Buenos Aires durchgeführt haben. Initiiert wurde dieser Prozess die Kulturstiftung des Bundes und das Programm Museum Global. Dieses Programm, mit diesem Programm Museum Global möchte die Kulturstiftung des Bundes deutschen Museen ermöglichen, ihre Sammlung in eine globale Perspektive zu rücken und eine globale Vorzeichen zu setzen. Denn, ähm, Sie wissen vielleicht, in einem Kern wird das im Ausstellungsprogramm und auch durch Ankäufe der Sammlung in den letzten Jahren schon sehr bewusst vorangetrieben, aber eine Retrospektive Betrachtung, Sammlung unter globalen Vorzeichen ist nicht möglich. Das erfordert einfach andere Ressourcen zeitlicher, inhaltlicher und finanzieller Art. Und durch dieses Programm war uns das möglich. Wir sind eines der nur vier Häuser in Deutschland, die in diesem Programm bisher partizipieren. Dazu gehören die Kunstsammlung in Nordrhein-Westfalen, die Nationalgalerie Berlin, das Lebachhaus in München und in NMK. Und dieser Prozess, den wir dort begonnen haben, sicherlich ein Prozess, der nicht abgeschlossen ist, äh, hat in vier Jahren wurde er auch flankiert und begleitet durch verschiedene Treffen mit internationalen Kuratoren und Kollegen an unterschiedlichen Orten der Welt. Eines dieser Treffen, das sicherlich auch ein bisschen der Auslöser war für diese konkrete Kooperation mit Lateinamerika von 2015 in Salvador de statt, in dem Museum, was damals geleitet wurde von unserem heutigen Gast, und Michelle Vicente. Und äh, seit diesem Punkt äh, sind wir miteinander in Kontakt und vernetzt und äh, es gab immer wieder auch Treffen um diese Idee, es ist eines globalen Museums nicht nur innerhalb Deutschlands, sondern inter innerhalb einer internationalen Kunstszene zu diskutieren und voranzutreiben. Diese Veranstaltung ist ein Teil dieses Prozesses, der natürlich weitergehen wird, nicht abgeschlossen ist mit einfach nur einer, einfach nur einer Ausstellung, äh, sondern es ist natürlich etwas, was uns in den nächsten Jahren weiter beschäftigen wird. Da geht es nicht nur ausschließlich um die Sammlung in MMK, sondern sicherlich um auch andere Prozesse. Wie können wir als Museum zukünftig uns globaler aufstellen? Was sind die Möglichkeiten und aus welcher Perspektive Geschichte kommen wir, um diese Geschichte auch kritisch zu reflektieren? Ich freue mich sehr, dass wir mit Susanne Titz eine Kollegin hier haben, die Direktorin ist vom Museum am Teilwerk in München-Gladbach, ebenfalls ein hans wie vielleicht einige von Ihnen wissen. Susanne Titz hat in den vergangenen Jahren auch ganz gezielt immer wieder die eigene Museumsgeschichte, die eigene Sammlungsgeschichte hinterfragt, da ganz wichtige Impulse gegeben und finde ich sehr innovative Ideen, auch im Umgang mit der Sammlung. Da freue ich mich sehr, dass die beiden heute aus ihrer Perspektive über das Museum im globalen Kontext sprechen werden. Hier Marcello, this is honest, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you here and we are very um, curious to hear the discussions from the takers. Ich möchte jetzt das Wort kurz an die Leiterin unserer Abteilung Bildung und Vermittlung weitergeben, Caroline Wohlkund, die uh, unsere Gäste noch weiter vorstellen wird. Ich wünsche uns allen einen Abend. Vielen Dank für Ihre Globalization. 
What does non-Western mean? Or which kind of perspectives seem important to involve? And with what kind of motivation? What do we want to learn? So um, I just want to um, introduce a short um, Marcelo. Marcelo um, is a researcher and curator and was the director of the Museo de Arte Moderna in Bahia in Brazil um, from 2012 to 2015. An amazing museum which brings together exhibition and education and is a, was a very vivid place. And he's currently, currently um, on the director's team of the Archiv de Arte Garden at the Stadtliche Kunstamt in Dresden and associated curator of the Museo do Art uh, do Mato in Bahia. Um, das Archiv or the archive of the Avantgarde contains 1,500,000 objects from the art avant-garde of the 20th century, which were collected by Guido Mazzona since the late 1960s. And I guess that this is a quite huge challenge um, to deal with all these um, objects, artworks, but also with photographies and letters and etc. And um, it's, I guess, a great challenge to ask himself how is it possible to make this kind of archive productive, productive for the future. Susanne Tietz has been the director of the Museum of Thalberg in München Gladbach since 2004. And um, from before, um, she had led the uh, as artistic director um, the Neue Aachener Kunstverein. And the focus of the collection um, was and is contemporary art. For example, Josef Beuys had his first museum exhibition in Mönchengladbach, and um, which is a nice parallel to our houses that we have the same architect, Hans Holland. So maybe this will be also this is also a kind of a body which um, inhabits um, knowledge and yeah, creates a surrounding. Um, currently she shows the exhibition from Da An, which I don't know if the terms might write, but kind of a reenactment of Johannes Kladder's um, exhibition from 1967. And I guess we're getting more information maybe during the talk. Kladder invited um, boys, Bothas, Bewin, to, um, to, yeah, get or to, to see works which are very critical to the museum. So I'm very um, curious about the talk because these both guests were um, kind of very deep inside archives and collections and I'm very interested in what kind of questions um, emerged from this process. So I'll pass the word over to Marcelo. Thank you very much. First, thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. I apologize, I should uh, be able to speak in German. I can understand German, but I think in German is more difficult. And so, really happy that you can be here, really happy to have this moment to talk with Suzanne. Um, there's so much things to, to talk about it. I, I, yes, I, I, I just would like to start from one image what you are, what you can see here in this black, white, always disappearing image. This is is the original um, project of uh, made by this Italian Brazilian architect Lina Bobardi in 1959. So this is the idea of a museum is school. So she started to develop the idea of what and how a museum school should uh, operate the behavior regarding society or something. And we can talk, we could talk a lot, a lot about what the content of this image. And here we have an image of the um, archive of avant-garde in Dresden. This is uh, one of the, um, we call these essays. Uh, that we are doing in Dresden, and and then we decide to uh, to take a look in this material by Lina, and we made this on the floor of the the, the pool where we are now. Uh, just like, then you hit the, the German version. So we have this line here, and this is the a lot of ideas about how this museum school should behave. So you see the idea of publications and 
which kind of models of exhibitions and etc. And etc. And but for tonight, it would be interesting to concentrate ourselves only in what's happening in this line here uh, on the left. She was thinking that uh, the museum should work in for this side and in a regular basis, but also the museum should be in charge of recreate a biennial. And what she wrote is should be um, in Portuguese it will be um, how to translate this properly. The idea for her was should be a biennial of um, all modern art. So the idea is that she was thinking that time is that modernism or modern art or etc. Um, we should understand this in a much more larger way. And, and she was thinking about a biennial about all modernisms and how we can understand this if you take a look about this very exciting exhibition that's happening here now. What, the, what she was thinking about all modernism. Probably you are thinking about something like Okay, let's take um, some modernism experiences in, in a country and then another country, etc. But she was much more ambitious. When she was saying all modernism, she was thinking about that uh, an art, uh, a craft object made uh, in wood that you can find on the streets can also be part of modern art. She was thinking about that everything could be modern in a way that we can understand modernism as a desire for autonomy and we need to understand the context of every culture and to try to picture what modernism is. So the idea is to have a biennial where the folk art should be uh, exhibited side by side uh, Marcel Duchamp. And then you could put an ethnographical object. And then you can put a, a lot of lot of different objects. Because modernism is something much larger. There's just one, one narrative. In this case, the European narrative. In this case, regarding the, the, the experience of a global museum, we are still facing the same kind of problems. So, how can we, how could we be able to contextualize what we are seeing regarding the, 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 the own culture of such objects? Meaning, what exactly could be modernism in Syria or what exactly could be modernism in Argentina or etc. So this idea of the global museum or global collections starts to touch issues much more um, let's say dedicated issues than just trying to, to to take something from a from one culture and put this in a position of uh, comparing time or comparing objects. So, and of course, she was thinking about this in 1959 and we are still looking for some kind of answers. What does it mean all modernism without, this is very important, without any hierarchy? Maybe Suzanne can say something about if this is possible. <laughs> to think about without hierarchies. Uh, yes, I tend to, uh, to go always back to the 60s and 70s, 1960s and 70s, because there was a thought about that at that time, which was, in my view, uh, filling 
um, the thoughts of artists, of curators, and of architects, of several other people who were in the theoretical field, in the social field, and it was, uh, in general, a much larger thought about what does it mean to be modern, what does it mean to be human, and what does it mean to become maybe emancipated as a human being in modernity. And I think this was so large, and therefore I'm so glad about this diagram, because, uh, or about the term museum as school. Because I think it's not meant to be museum as a school of authorities, but it's the end of the authorities, and it's a museum and a meaning of, well, like uh, an emancipatory space where you can maybe try out to become, well, an active viewer, um, someone who is uh, maybe also active in, in thinking, in speaking, and in reacting to art, and to be part of this art project, which is not about objects, but about communication. And I think this is so huge, what modernism in this time, and it's good that you say it started somewhere in the 40s, and uh, in the 50s, and not only with Boyce and Robert Fiu uh, somewhere in the late 60s. So it was really the desire to, um, to act in a way also against modernism as it came up to be, like bureaucracy, like uh, being workers in uh, more and more uh, alienated uh, working situations, to have the cities uh, which were consisting of streets and cars, and not about well, like the pedestrian and the playgrounds, and then you would have the segregation of the cities and all this. I think it was a counteraction which happened. It was not exactly always like answering or reacting mm -hmm. to everything, but it was a mood which came up or a desire which came up somewhere in um, this high rise of modernism suddenly people realize it's not everything good and we need to get back to also something. And I think this is how uh, folk art or how um, like the, the low became interesting. It was not only pop, it was also, well, of course, getting back to something spiritual, it was getting back to something which is like intense between bodies, so very nice to have here, Körper und Kunst, like bodies and art. And um, so it's something which can be a much more interesting um, definition or no, field for talking about a global museum than the way I, with brief thought, always had in mind, well, it's like compiling objects from everywhere and trying to find out if there are comparisons and who learned from where or is it bad to say who learned from where because we shouldn't yeah. say that. So it's, it's not about um, art history but it's about also anthropology of the mo modern times. Brilliant, brilliant, because Lina Bobart left this document but she also left a series of uh, letters. She used to write letters to herself. In one of those letters she was saying this, we need to, 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 to have a much larger point of view about culture, we need to escape from art history. Let's say the idea of her was, and then she had this very strong statement, she said, art history is the concentration camp of art. And, 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 and then we need to escape from, from art history. And then she said, well, okay, if you get out of art history, then why we are saying she was thinking about this? Because if you think about only the straight line, the official line about how to understand art, we can look to someone like Flavio de Carvalho, there's this brilliant Brazilian artist that is in the exhibition here, uh, a series of photos of performance of Flavio. But Flavio 
if you hear about the street band of art history, you can say, okay, Fravio is a consequence of something that happened in Europe. But in fact, Fravio was doing fluxus in his is thinking in the same way that Fluxus was thinking, but Fabio was doing this in, in, in the 20s. And, and then how you can, in which line you're gonna put someone like uh, Fabio de Carvalho, that are totally, I need to tell you that you need to go there and see uh, 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 this very uh, uh, crazy person. And, and you know, I say, okay, if you, get out of the art history, what are you going to put in place of this? And then she said exactly what you said, it's fantastic. She said, we need to look at things from the anthropological point of view. Uh, because everything is human. And then we need to understand, and then she comes with the idea about which kind of anthropology she was thinking about. It. And then this is open another door. We are not talking about the official anthropology, but the idea that anthropology is a science of meeting when one culture meets another culture and they need to develop a proper language of communication without any hierarchy, without the idea that something is superior to another, but we, we, we should develop this idea that how can we deal with this moment that something that two cultures are meeting. And then, and then she also said, okay, which kind of anthropology could be, can be? And then we go to Michel Lehi, uh, from, from the Surrealists, that said, the real anthropology is you need to accept the idea that you are putting your fiction over the culture of, of, of the other person. So the anthropology is made of science, but also made of invention, fictions, etc. You knew, you knew to deal with, with this. Are we doing this now? What do you think? Uh, I think uh, only a few museums are doing. And I think that all this large term of culture uh, got lost uh, in a strange way. And I think, uh, well, especially as we're in a building by Hans Holein, we are confronted with a very visionary idea of architecture. He, he was the one who, um, who created this definition in 1967 to say everything is architecture. And then he, he really set up a, a whole big field of terms, of, uh, of constellations, of uh, the human and the artificial, and everything together is architecture. So much more than just the building and the spaces. And then he was also telling about architecture that this should be defined um, from the meaning of space, space is like the thing where um, a human is uh, like safe, but also is like um, surrounded in order to uh, to be active, to do something. So like a, a safe for um, a space for for living, for encounters. You see it in in these spaces here. Uh, of the museum, it's all about promenades, about staging, about uh, really having an atmosphere, which is part of the art experience. And so the space is serving for something which makes art interesting in space. And uh, the same thing is happening in Mönchengladbach. And Mönchengladbach was his very first museum or his very first building. And it was um, designed uh, totally around the idea of having um, a space which serves to other fields of thought. And so, for example, it's uh, like a labyrinth. Um, the clever spaces, the Kleeblatt Räume, 
and they are all leading to your activity to uh, get from one space to the other by your proper idea to connect objects one to the other and also to connect um, maybe things which apparently have nothing in common. But at the same time, what he had in mind, or what maybe more the artists he worked with, because he was very close to the artists, and Clutters worked with artists like uh, Hannes Darboven or Marcel Brotas, Stanley Brown, and, um, and Robert Fiu and George Brecht, who did performances, um, they thought about this museum architecture to be something which has an energy to, um, to, to communi uh, communicate, really. Mm -hmm. And I think what they had in mind was maybe realized as a building, as a built manifesto here, but when we see museums which came later, uh, so not here, this is still, I think, a real idea, but uh, when you see now how museums came up in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, you have the big temples again. You have the adoration as your um, well, position towards the art, because the art is big, the wall is big, maybe your way from one object to the other is long, and you have a pathos, a pathetical gesture in the museum again, which is, in my view, a myth of sorority. And what they had in mind, also Lina Libabo, uh, was, uh, was um, totally uh, the contrary. It was not about the authority, and it was not about the pathetic uh, building of a museum, but it was the contrary. It was about something which is maybe um, necessary to create, well, like space. Therefore, you have architecture and you have a museum in order to um, create something together, the togetherness of things. But you're not creating an order. You're not saying space one to 20, and this is art history. And uh, that was one of these main issues, I think, also for this building here. You know, in, in, in the archive of avant-garde, we, we, we have a piece by Robert Filio regarding your museum. Yes. The toilets. <laughs> the toilets. So, I don't know if you know this is a project by Robert Filio for the toilets of the museum in Mugrafla. So, Robert Filio uh, was, was um, proposing this idea. Woman, the door, woman for the woman, women, men, and artists. <laughs> and I was really so excited when I found this in the collection. I said, I will need to show this uh, and to the people. And what came to my attention was I was thinking about okay, and can, can a museum give the possibility of the audience to choose? And even even take this radical decision: should I go and men, women, or the artist? And then when we show this piece, in, interesting uh, um, uh, architect, and he came, he looked at the piece and he said, "I want to know what was behind the door. Uh, the museum, uh, the toilet of the artist was different of the of the toilet of." The, the men or, or women, and then we have a discussion and say, probably not, because this is not the case. The case is the audience in front of the toilet needs to take this decision. And then the, someone in the audience visiting the museum just can say, yes, I'm an artist, I'm going to go to this toilet. <laughs> And you can do that in Antwerp, because uh, not in our museum, but in Antwerp in the MUCA, uh, they realized it. And they still have the toilets uh, for women, for men, and for artists. And unfortunately, last week I was there, and again I had in mind, well, I, you, you should see what is there behind the door of the artist toilet, and again I didn't. <laughs> it's so, so funny, so next time I go there. You should, you should go there uh, because we 
in, in first, first of all, just one uh, remark. We are start to ask your question, what, what we can do with the archive? Because we are discussing some materials that you just open a, open a very uh, drawer and then we start to take some pieces, a piece of paper, and you have these ideas around us. So, and but in this talk about this, those ideas, we start to talk about this, this desire of having no hierarchy and regarding the audience and the space, regarding the artist and the non-artist, uh, let's say, and the idea of projects that I know. So, a Brazilian project, let's say. We have the idea of... Uh, we have the idea of uh, the museum school by the Nobopati, but we also, we had this, this another idea of the museum as a forum. This was made in Sao Paulo in the 1960s, and the director just took a decision that every exhibition uh, exp space inside the building should be given to the artists, and they need to work there. And so the idea that the exhibition should disappear and to give place to the idea of a collective way of uh, uh, working together. Back to the exhibition here that we saw that we, we need to return to the Global Museum. One thing that was interesting was, I know that we, that we don't need to talk about the exhibition, but for me it was really nice to observe how the exhibition uh, here has not give answers but really just proposing questions about the, con the possible connections that we can find around all, all, all the species. And not the idea that we have a superior narrative and the other narratives are just following, going behind this. And just, just to finish this, then I need to go back to Flavio de Carvalho and, and because in, 19, in 1931, this crazy artist, he decided to create a project named 30 Days of Kids, Children and Crazy People. So he decided to make an exhibition where all the, all the material uh, that was uh, present in the exhibition room was just drawings made by kids, seven years old kids, and really crazy people. That he went to the, to the asylum, and then he asked to, to, the, to the people that was there and be treated uh, to make drawings, and it certain because he was interested in this idea that we could not um, define creativity. You cannot judge creativity. Creativity is just there. Maybe this is going to be a kind of a key to understand what a possible global museum could be. Like in a, in, in a fictional global museum, we don't judge anymore. Um, when I was uh, also, together with you now in this exhibition here, suddenly I realized in Latin America there was so much about participation, about uh, creating an activity of those people who maybe before were only like viewers of art, suddenly they were active. And then uh, there's also a presentation of an art, uh, architect's collective who were doing like um, activities uh, instead of uh, just building spaces. I wonder how political this was or this is, and I wonder how political a global museum would be. Because there is also, uh, well maybe first one could ask you, because you are uh, very familiar with the whole history of Latin America, how was the relationship 
of those things we see, which are very much talking about freedom, mm -hmm. and the political situation where I could imagine that even those things were kind of forbidden, or maybe underculture, or counterculture, or whatever. Um, I, I would like to know the historical, but also the actual aspect. What do you think could be now a global museum? Yeah, maybe. Can you talk about what form? Uh, um, I, 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 I can give an, an issue regarding an experience that I have regarding a, a group discussing the Humboldt Forum project in Berlin. They, in this discussion, uh, they start to talk about how this place should be an anti, not an anti-museum, but a museum anti-colonialism, for instance. A museum where um, we should have no hierarchies, etc., etc. But in the end, in the conversation, we, uh, the hierarchies start to come and the discourse. And it was very fascinating because, and this is, uh, we are in, in, in Germany, so it's very interesting because one of the persons that was in the discussion said this, the global museum, or the idea of a global culture, and etc., uh, should be made because nowadays, uh, the idea that I have my roots or my origins and etc. This is, is giving place to, to the idea that we belong to a kind of... Uh, everyone now, nowadays is having a similar experience in life or something like that. And five minutes after uh, this person uh, said something like that, uh, someone replied, um, I don't know, I don't remember exactly what was the question, but the, 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 the reaction was, no, but I'm from Bavaria. <laughs> and then I was looking, looking at this person and said, but you just said 10 minutes ago that this has just disappeared. And now we are saying, I'm from Bavaria. Uh, and so let's say the Global Museum is much more trick <laughs> than our desires, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, shown us uh, 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 all the time. Even, and this is interesting because of your, your question about Latin America and, and, and this, because when you're thinking about colonialism, you're always thinking about this experience of that you have this major economic force that is, is, is um, molding or trying to mold another culture there in another land. But for me, it was quite curious to observe how this experience of colonialism can happen inside the same country. Meaning, what, what does it mean when a city has such economical, economical power that this economical power in the end is decide who is the good art who are the good artists and who are the good artists that, needs, that can be visible to the international arena. And what we're going to do with all these other artists from small cities, from uh, <coughs> villas or etc., that they don't, they don't have this economic power to be visible. And then you can say, yeah, so colonialism, if you understand this in a much larger sense, is happening all the time in and, 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 and different cultures. And just to give a straight answer about your other questions regarding Latin America, this Valparaiso school, how they can manage to make to, to propose radical developments during a dictatorship. Probably because even <laughs> because uh, um, Let's say the ideas that they had in that time, they 
wasn't clear even for even for the, the the forces in power. They did understand exactly what those crazy people they are doing on the page. Because if they go there with a message saying we are against the regime, you can understand this as a political act. But if you go there dressing in a very strange way, singing very strange songs, how can you understand that this can be a radical political attitude? So, and this is quite fascinating because do, I was speaking with an artist from the former DDR, an artist that made uh, Super 8 moves, and he said to me, in that time, the state didn't understand. They, they don't know what to do because there was just crazy people doing strange things in front of the camera. So, this is against us. There's this, let's say, parenthesis that something can happen because of this misunderstanding that, that, that happened and, and, and things like that. And regarding Brazil, it's even more strange because we're talking about here about Latin America. But if you go to, to Brazil today and you open any newspaper or you watch any uh, news network, we're going to receive information about Europe, about Asia, about... But you know nothing about what's happening in Argentina. We know nothing that what's happening in Peru. And then, and then Cal Camisa, Luis Camisa, also has a very radical <laughs> project in the exhibition uh, here uh, in this museum. And Camisa wrote this in the sentence. Latin America is in fact a conceptual piece. And, and, and this is not only a geographical place, but really a conceptual place. Then things can happen this way, let's say. But I, I would say, I'd like to ask you this, maybe in Europe it's not that different. What do you know about Eastern Europe right now? Mm. <laughs> um. Yeah, Jan Sala said a theory. Uh, he said that uh, the whole world history, but especially Europe, would have been totally different if there would have been Lutheringian. So the good Europe was always along the Rhine, and he also connected uh, the areas of good art and good uh, communication always in this area where he had, well, Charlemagne and then uh, the whole way uh, Europe got split. Mm -hmm. um, this was like from medieval times something which went wrong and he thought that a better situation, a better society and all that would have happened um, under this sign. So he um, had some sort of visions around uh, another kind of Europe. And I think he was communicating uh, with Marcel Brothaus and uh, with Lohaus and Anita Decker and all these people. Maybe you should ask uh, Egidio Marzona. I would like to know uh, what he's thinking about that. Because they were at that time communicating ta um, uh, in many cases without knowing each other's language. So, uh, Brothers didn't talk German, Boys didn't talk uh, French, and English was not a working language at that time. So, their ways to communicate with each other, and they did, was um, with translators or with strange sorts of, uh, well, seeing languages. Uh, so, certain terms needed to function in communication. And I think this is also interesting when we think about how the art communicated that uh, this whole matter of language, which is now like, well, we are doing pigeon English, but um, we do that, we practice it and we try to communicate. In that time, 
um, they did crazy things, which maybe also led to diagrams or to sorts of abbreviations in order to, to get something uh, in common or to discuss uh, some issues of the art. It's very, very interesting what you're saying. Just um, about transmission and communication, because sometimes you spend so much of your um, energy, you spend so much of energy thinking about it's very hard things like art history, artists, etc. And we, we, we start to forget very um, precious things like why and how and why they start to talk to each other in the 60s in a way that it was not possible in the, in the 50s because of the invention of the jet plane. Jet plane, the airplane, the jet airplane. So what was the issue? The issue was an artist in New York trying to talk to artists in Germany. This is, this is, you should write a letter. This letter is going to take like weeks to come and then we're going to receive, and then we need to wait for another week to receive an internet, etc. And then come to check me. And then, in one week, we could have an answer. In one week, we could have a, 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 a reply about the ideas. And thinking about this direction about communication and transmission, I, I once I met Seth Sigelop in Amsterdam, and I was pretty curious, and I said, in that time, please tell me about Elio Tisica, also in a very beautiful room here. Uh, talk to me about Elio Tisica was, let's say, visible, uh, and, and then he, and then Sigelop looked at me and said, of course not. You as a country, you, you didn't exist in the time. Uh, uh, everything was happening only uh, from... Uh, and the South side was totally, totally unrecognized. And then we started... And then I, I, and then I started to check the idea if... How was... Uh, how many jet planes was uh, there crossing? And at that time there not that much regarding the jet planes crossing between Europe and 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 uh, and, and United States. So you see how uh, uh, um, this very um, small issue regarding technology has changed everything and, and regarding all, all, all these means of, of, of communication. But then Edward Seeker decided to come to to, to come to United States and then to London. And, 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 and then start to face it was possible to be part of this international concert of arts. So, and the experience for him was very bad. <laughs> uh, just now I, I realize or I, I come up to, to this feeling that uh, in the 1960s suddenly the idea of an international art collection came up and uh, it's fascinating just because we have this exhibition now which is um, trying to uh, well, show the archive of the exhibition history in Merchant Lacker from 1967 to 78. We realized that um, the Rhineland was really a hot spot for people from everywhere, or well, not from the south, but from uh, America, from the US, and they uh, were there communicating a lot. Uh, galleries and museums or collectors were spending tickets, plane tickets, which were super expensive. But um, it was, in fact, this sudden um, possibility to get close. But then, when you see how collections in modern times in many countries were national. So like you were, I was surprised you were uh, talking about the museum um, in Buenos Aires, which was a 
to a fully Argentinian yeah. uh, collection. I was in um, in several countries. It was like in England, totally astonishing. When colleagues told me, yes, yes, of course, it's most British art, and we can only buy British art because non-British art is not um, supported by the government. We can't afford it because we have only fundings for British art. And uh, then I came to India and I saw, yes, they are now having a modern museum, but it's only Indian art. Maybe someone who came, who passed by, or like in Poland, it was maybe uh, use of boys Poland transport, but um, you see that these museums have been uh, very national or regional, and only few started to work in this international project, and by chance, it was in this Rhineland area and in some other hotspots like in Amsterdam, that you had this communication and uh, the constellation of art from uh, several contexts, several regions. It's, um, it's bizarre how national uh, art collections yeah. happen. And, 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 and there's a there's an interesting essay uh, written by the German philosopher Paulus Kreuz about collections. And because one thing that let's say we start to look at this idea of global museum, global collections, etc., we of course as we all we start to develop this idea that everything is is beginning now. Right, uh, uh, um, or uh, we cannot see very clear, clear about some other kind of uh, influences and etc. And then, in this essay, Paul Gross is, is is talking about, let's say, now um, you're talking about these national collections and, and, and places this lack of communication between one culture is not. Be because we are paying attention to the art museum, to the museum of art. But if you take a look in the ethnographical museum, then the history starts to become different. And what Kreuz was saying is, we still need to understand that all the history of the avant-garde in Europe and the history of the modern movements in Europe was somehow the explosion start to come from the ethnographical museum in the sense that the artists start to go there and they start to be mm, touched by some image or imaginations that they never uh, had previous contact contact before. So and of course we cannot What's the crime of, of talking about this nowadays? Because, of course, you're going to say, yeah, this is the colonial museum. This is the colonial, colonial result of this experience, and etc. But in this case, we are talking about the exchange of imagination. In the sense that if you have the economic trade crossing ocean seas, and etc., they are, they are bringing. Uh, commodities to Europe, going to Africa, and bring coffee, but they are not only bringing coffee, they are bringing forms and, and different uh, uh, ways of understanding reality and, and, and somehow. And so maybe one way of thinking about global museums should be reinvent the ethnographical museum. Let's say. In the sense that the ethnographical museum could be also the art museum without a, without a, a strong border anymore. That we could cross those lines, and and this is a very interesting question: like why an African piece, an African sculpture? should be seen in the ethnographical museum and why an Asian piece from the same historical moment 
should be seen in the art museum. There's something strange in this uh, uh, way of uh, creating uh, this form of organizations. So when you see this exhibition here, for instance, you can you can see a, oh, a lot of uh, ethnographic and and going back to the anthropological strategies present there. But uh, museums tend to uh, isolate the objects, and therefore uh, it's also pretty risky to take this African something into uh, an art museum and to say, this is now talking about itself or about its reception, about its reason, uh, because uh, you're doing colonialization again, because you're, you're doing that what Picasso and all these guys did, they just found them extremely beautiful. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, but then, uh, then we start to go to, to a fur fur further questions, let's say. In instead of decolonize the museum, instead of decolonize the culture, how could we decolonize our imagination? Hmm. <laughs> this is a very, very, mm, let's say, mm, I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer. Is there anything? Is yeah. yeah. With, uh, with knowledge, knowing uh, deeply some cultures, of course it's impossible to know all the cultures, but you take one African culture, you know it well, and then it's impossible to you can't colonize it anymore. I grow, you grow up in a visual world which is so uh, familiar with you that you um, are not able so easily to overcome um, this way of um, education. I work in an anthropological museum and that's my experience with visitors um, um, who, are, um, who really believe that the visual world they know is the right one. It's a very, very strange thing. People think, um, I know this is aesthetic and this is not. I know this is beautiful and this is not. I know it because I grew up with something which made me know. Maybe there is no way out. Huh? No way out. No. Maybe there is no way out. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, maybe we should work with that. Yeah. We should just uh, see that this is also uh, the interesting aspect of communication, that there are these differences. Yeah. Because uh, I think in, in, in some degrees, it's much more important to talk about these differences mm -hmm. than to pretend that uh, we are one family, or how was it, yeah. like the Benetton term, like, come together. Yeah, yeah. Because if you, you still believe in this idea of this, um, just, one family, hold hands, and etc. This is very interesting because then we go and start to 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 take the road and, and going back to the 18th century. This idea of the of Clérum, this idea that uh, everything can be um, knowledge. That uh, let's say there's a common knowledge that should be divided or or. Or or, or or something similar like this. And then this is very interesting because then we're going to be back to the cabinet de curiosité again. Mm. Yeah. And meaning, we, we, we start to go back to this idea of okay, this piece from Africa and this piece from, from, from India and this piece from another culture and etc. They, uh, they are part of the common something or, 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 or something uh, in, among those lines, let's say. And this is quite curious because if you're thinking about globalization as that globalization starts to have its first chapter in the 16th century, 
and we start uh, of the colonies and, and, and the moments that uh, uh, new lands start to be found uh, around the globe and, and, and etc. Uh, or maybe maybe we are in this kind of uh, we are facing the same problem again because maybe we don't have that much options in the way that you used to think that we have in the sense that maybe we are still dreaming about about this very romantic coming from the romances that someday we're going to have a universal concert of nations and everything is going to fall in places and, and again maybe we should start to, to thinking about it uh, no maybe there's no universal Maybe we should to 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 and or maybe we need to try to understand the first one in a different way without it. Yeah. Yeah, I think this a different way because I I just got uh, pretty frightened when I thought about what I said mm -hmm. because talking about differences or saying well we're all different also means like we are uh, getting rid of the universal or of something like the. Uh, well, the human rights issue yeah. that we have in a way as our uh, our common law we should have uh, since the 20th century, we agreed on something to be a world family yeah. and we're just in a risky state at the moment and therefore I, I also feel like we need to get back to the universal but uh, I don't know in yeah, which way this global term could yeah. then also be a title of the term of the museum. Let's, let's speculate it. Maybe we should accept the idea of universal that accept contradictions. Mm -hmm. So it's not fixing. It's, it's, it's changing. It's, 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 it's moving. It's absorbing. Uh, uh, in the way that when, when this universal walks, this universe is start absorbing. So it's not static anymore. And then we and then we can go back to this idea of Lina and 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 and, and, and the idea of this for her the universal museum should be a museum that should accept the idea that a museum could not be anymore a museum of modern art. A museum could not be anymore a museum of contemporary art. A museum could not be anymore an ethnographic museum. But the museum should be a museum of art. Point. <laughs> and what's the role of the artists then? So at that time, mm -hmm. artists were also those who wanted to change the museum, yeah. who created anti-museums or created structures which were uh, like playing with the museum or uh, showing us, reflecting the role of the institution. Do you think there is also a new idea for a museum coming up by artists? Or is it just the curators who are talking about it? No, no, no. God forbid, no. Uh, uh, <laughs> No. Um, regarding this, I think that um, um, we should still learn. We need to learn from from the artists. And this is a very interesting for me. Uh, this is very personal, but this is one question that I, I, I'm always asking to myself because uh, you know this. This also. Brazilian critic that uh, Reina Sofia is make a, a big project about him, Mario Pedrosa. And Mario Pedrosa wrote this sentence say, the artist, we should give the, 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 the voice to the artist always. And because we need to learn from the artist. But maybe what we need to, to learn again and ask ourselves that is what exactly we are learning from the artists. So in, in, in the sense that 
how can we have a museum as a temple after Marcel Bottas? Exactly. So we didn't learn anything. That's <laughs> what I mean. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Or how can you think about Joseph Beuys, for instance, in the idea of uh, uh, democracy in a museum? And how the museum can still work with so very strong structures of power after Joseph Beuys? So, what, so in this case, we are maybe we are refusing to learn from the artists, and and, and, and probably this is this is a much bigger issue than why you are now refusing to 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 learn from 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 the artists for economical reasons and etc. etc. I can tell you a very interesting story about who can. Le who can learn and, and who can teach, or how these things happen. I know this artist in Bahia, nobody knows him, right? He's one of these guys that I'm saying about the colonization that happens inside the same country. He, he came from the city of 2000, um, what do you say this in English? Habitant? Inhabitants? Uh, and so it's very, very small, small city. And then he decided he to create a, 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 a museum there. And he took the house of the father and started to collect things that he was thinking that was interesting along the neighbors, like someone that has created something to open the door. That's all, this is a piece for the museum. But one day, he decided to organize a gay parade in the city. <laughs> so, um, so the question, think, imagine this, you have 2,000 inhabitants in a very small city in the deep, deep, deep side of the, the state of Bahia. And then what, what he did, he go there during the night, and he made a lot of uh, posters, and then he put all the posters ar ar around the streets saying, on Saturday, it's going to happen, the gay parade in the city. And it was a kind of a... Um, kind of a joke and etc. And of course, in the morning, the whole city was totally in panic. <laughs> like, what's happening here? It's going to be a gay parade? What is a gay parade? <laughs> the, 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 the first question. Uh, uh, and then, and then he starts to become very nervous because, of course, he, 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 he did this in secret. Nobody knew that it was him. And, him, and then he was say in, in the placard and in, in, in the posters. And at 7 o'clock in the, in the main um, square of the, 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 this small village, everyone is going to meet each other to go to the gay parade. And then he was really scared and saying, and then the, the, the week starts to go, and then finally Saturday comes. And then we went there, it was like 500, 600 people there. And then he went there, and, 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 then, and then finally he said, uh, uh, I did this, but wasn't serious, so it's, it's not true. And then, and then the, the, the population said to him, no, now we want a gay parade. <laughs> because it's going to be fun. <laughs> so, and then, in this conversation with him, uh, we were talking really about this um, dynamic of um, who is teaching who, in this case. So in this case, it was the artist learning from the audience, mm -hmm. somehow. So, Maybe, maybe we should all, we should always, we should thinking about the structures able really to move all the time. It re reinvent itself all the time and not to be static and, and anymore. Yeah, that's great. That's uh, really wonderful. And um, I'm astonished that this is so much fitting against 
uh, again to this um, idea of that uh, museum director Johannes Clutters, yeah. who who wrote there in uh, 1967-68 this text, which was titled "Schüttelt Staub ab," so like um, remove the dust. Mm -hmm. And who talked about the anti museum or the future museum as a museum which um, has, in fact, no walls, but on the other hand, uh, takes everything in. So he, he was all the time thinking about something which is going beyond the institution and which is moving, because anti is also not meaning like anti art, so the contrary but it's anti-museum against the traditional term of museum. So the traditional term of a museum is the mausoleum. It's like things are dead when they come to the museum or when they end in the museum and then they are ending there. Yeah. Uh, and the anti-museum is only meant as an anti in this meaning of keeping the things vivid when they arrive in the museum, when they are in the museum and to create something which makes them act, uh, keeps them active. And this is, I think, um, with so many works of art, now our, heart, our problem, because how to keep a boy's installation alive, um, or how to keep all those things alive, which were um, originally parts of performances, of actions, now they look like uh, relics, and they were relics. Uh, so like a reliquia instead of a relict. Yeah. And uh, so we have a complicated goal. And um, <coughs> I, I like it very much how you, you speak about the move. We need to, to keep that moving. Yeah, yeah. And I have a question for you, because you know I'm a big fan of Clouders and a big <coughs> fan of your work with the Clouders space. And I, and I read this somewhere that Clouders has this idea to have a secret room or uh, um, I read somewhere that there's this idea that the idea of make an exhibition, but the, the venue, the space should be closed and should be open only when the wind was in a good direction. <laughs> and so this is very interesting because we start to, to think about so many different possibilities about what a museum could be. And one question that we need to ask ourselves is why is not happening that much then? And why we are not paying attention to the clouders in Germany or Lina Bobat in Brazil or Willem Sanderberg and the and, and Netherlands to develop these other possibilities about what an exhibition can be, what a museum can be, and which and how we could really start to learn from the artists again in a very brave way. So maybe this is a question, a question that we, we, we can ask to ourselves. Why do you think it's not happening? Uh, it was a good last word that you had. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I hope it's going to happen because otherwise it's no fun. I, I always hope to keep that energy or that idea. Uh, I don't know if it's working, but I know that this is the energy it takes and uh, it's also all about this museum as a production site for artists, which keeps the museums uh, alive or vivid or in move, as you said, and uh, yeah, I, I think it would be uh, it would be really tragical to work without that energy. But yeah, maybe you're right. It's uh, it's something which is happening in museums that they yeah. are <laughs> working rather as mausoleums. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe. The global museum could be exist in this museum that is moving all the time, yeah. mm -hmm. not the static version. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I? Can I ask sure. a question? We are having fun here. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, um, we are talking about the global museum here, but um, I wonder um, what 
role plays the local in this idea. I, I know from that you were working a lot with local communities in Bahia, and uh, I think it was a very nice uh, story you told about the gay parade in the small village, and this is something I'm really kind of trying to get my head around. How can we be expanding towards a kind of global perspective and still don't lose the local contents? And is there is there a contradiction or is there a way to think the local in the global or the global in the local? And I wonder what your the thoughts are about this. In my, in my experience, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, our experience, but in my experience, the main question is um, you, don't need to, you, you don't need to choose in the sense that the local community should be um, should have a voice regarding the global issues. So the question is how how let's 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 take a very mm, basic example. If someone in a city is being affected by um, a huge supermarket that came in town and start to 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 put it down the whole organization of that community about how the economy moves and etc and etc. So one thing that would be interesting is that the community should deal with the local problem that they have, but they need to understand this is not only the local a local problem, but this is the consequence of very different waves that are around and etc. And I think that one of the worst things that can happen to Amazon when the Amazon decides that the Amazon could be only important if he's addressing, let's say, the... And this is interesting because there's a difference between global issues and international issues. <laughs> so, uh, if, if the museum decides that, she, that the institution needs to address only the international issues, when the community cannot recognize uh, itself in the same issues, and then you start to be part of a very perverse system, and, 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 and the local community cannot really relate it, uh, itself in, 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 in this process. So, the, the smart museum is this. Now we are developed, uh, Susan and I, this new museum that's going to move in all the time. So, uh, this museum that's going to move in all the time should be able to, to take uh, the desire or the worries of the, the, the local community and to promote this translation regarding the global problems or the global issues and not to be a victim of this idea that you need to only address these international issues. It was my experience, let's say, working. And I think uh, maybe additionally uh, a museum should have an identity and which is connected to a local context and which is uh, also connected to a local history and to its institutional history. And I think uh, if you don't have that in mind, everything is just an international issue or it's a global brand, but then it's not connected to anything. So you need to create this, the local uh, logic for what you're dealing with in a global or in any thematical issue. You need to find out what is the logic to do it. Or in your context, on your local level. I think this is maybe uh, a thing which uh, fixes, it, uh, fixes it back to, to your institution. And, and to add, I just I want to say that for this really happen, the museum should really create the possibility of listening to the community. Like what the community think about the exhibitions that you are doing. Well, how the community feels regarding the space that the, the community is, is, is there. But this is an issue that museums, they don't do that often, is learning. 
because the museum has also uh, takes this hierarchy position that the museum is always giving lessons but not learning from the community. And the community has a desire, the community has issues. And, 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 and I'm not saying the community is right all the time because it's not a matter of right or wrong, but it's a matter of how can I listen to the people that come to to, to a museum, right? If you if you don't if you don't say anything, we're gonna go with this one. For we're gonna reinvent another museum. So yes, I just want to to add or to, to say something to this because I don't see or maybe the global and the local is one difference you can make, but um, I also see the hierarchies in education. So um, it's maybe sometimes not the question um, of. Um, I don't know how international you are, or but what kind of education you have or had, and um, so it's also different to address people with different issues. But um, maybe also there are people who don't want to say anything to the museum. Okay, it's, it's perfect. Fine. It's so perfect. It's fine. And it's also not so. Um, so it's also the question: How do you address or to get a connection? And to 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 make the how how um, how should be the circumstances or how should be the uh, what kind of um, offer you can do that the people are interested to give input or to get to say something to the, to the museum. So this is also not so. It's not the, yeah. It's not also this is not so easy. Yeah, but it's never gonna be easy. <laughs> But, uh, you are one of the very few international colleagues working in the German Museum. If you look at no. yeah, if you look at our museum, so of course there's a few people who have probably relatives from other countries, but mainly our staff is German in Germany. And how can you start changing perspective uh, if all the ones that are in the museums have been educated the same way, with the same teachers, with the same professors, repeating always the same the same story? So I think it's uh, it's really about also thinking not only about the audience but about the people who are there to reside within the museums. Yeah, I think you're right. But this is this is something that for me, uh, as my experience as a foreigner and in Germany, for me, I was talking to Susanna about this. What for me is quite curious is that people invite. So, so I don't know. I have a, 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 I got an invitation to talk about a radical museum in Brazil or a radical. But I ask myself, but why, why don't you are looking to Alexander Donner in Hanover in the twenties, and, and and Donner decided that an exhibition should be done that you cannot you can never show a piece without create an atmosphere. And a piece should be shown in a museum, and you and you really to create a big, a very radical environment to the piece. This is happening in Germany in the twenties. Or why why nobody's looking to the experience of Claudius? In a in a in a, in a why Claudius is not a debate in, in art history, or Claudius is not a, uh, so present? Let's say regarding publications, regarding essays, regarding... Why? Also, meaning, you can look to your own culture, it's there. But for me, the most mysterious thing that why this is not happening, and this is not only the, the, the German case. We are talking about Lina Bobardi here in the museum, but if you go to Brazil, everybody going to say to you that Lina was an architect that made some marvelous buildings, and that's it. Or Lena made a so fine furniture, and that's it. So why we start to disconnect ourselves to this, and and, and how could we reconnect ourselves to others, to Sunnyberg, to Lena Bobati, and all the people? Because it's here. It's just a, it's just a way of looking at. Yeah, the idea of the museum changed in these uh, 30 years, so the whole uh, rise and uh, success of museums led to uh, all these expectations that we would fulfill all the 
the issue of representation, the issue of, uh, well, like, um, commodity culture. And we, we need to work as an opera. And uh, maybe, uh, well, the small drama would be um, more the level or the, the size of artistic, uh, of new artistic ideas or new artistic concepts and also about uh, of the communication between art and the audience. If we have this huge size, we are maybe, uh, we are pretending to create a communication with the viewers. So we are doing lectures, we are doing guided tours, we are doing audio guides, we are doing now interactive events, but maybe we are not showing that this institution is something which is also questioning really itself or which is um, maybe also something like an experiment and also something in the middle of the city which is then transparent to the city. I think we are very much in a representational mode of our uh, work even if we are pretending to, to work with kids uh, from wherever in uh, areas where kids are not going to museums because the parents are not going to. I think uh, we are doing these things to, in, uh, to make it easier, but we are not showing that the museum is a site of, of the city, but we are still an extra space. And maybe we should find out how to get out of that role of the extra space, to be a space yes. Uh, within. Yeah. This is said something very important that we always think uh, about the museum once again, about this aesthetic, a building, but the museum is an idea. So the MMK is not only the building, this marvelous building, the collection is much more, it's an idea. Someone had an idea. So can you take this idea and go to the community? and start to develop projects in, 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 in other places of the city and, and, and work with groups of the city and you don't need to only stay in the position that the people need to come to here or you need to create some strategies to bring people here so if you do start to dematerialize you are so conceptual art uh, fans so if you start to dematerialize the idea of the museum the same way that the artists start to dematerialize the artwork, then you start to learn again from the artists, and then maybe we can we can go ahead in different directions. Once I had in a very, they they thought it was a crazy idea, but I was interested and looked at this marvelous collections. Caspar David Friedrich was there, and then I I asked the, a guy there. I said, Yeah, could we could we could we make audio guides? Only with kids, like, but not kids going there and say this is a painting from the third century. But that was interesting, and how the how a, a, a kid, a girl or a boy was feeling looking at the painting. So I was thinking about that you have an auto guy and a kid saying, oh, this is this this person. I can only see the back of. Him. This is making me so sad. I don't understand this. And I was thinking, yeah, this could be a very interesting experience for the museum. That you start to work with the idea of sensibility too. It's a, another fun thing. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Marcelo. Thank you. And I think it was very uh, inspiring, and I guess that um, the conversation will go on. And um, yeah, I think. There's no question left so far, and um, yeah, I was very happy that you're here. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. And thank you very much. And it was really nice to have fun with Susan in front of you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we need to work together.